Lucy Ryu. Thank you. <laughs> May Lucy Ryu, she is a French researcher fellow at the ISAC. She just finished a postdoc at the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency in Tokyo a year ago before she came to ISA in Villafranca. She worked there for three years for the Ayabusa 2 mission. And before that, she made her PhD in Paris in the University of Paris-Saclay regarding Martian mineralogy and the preservation of investigation on asteroid Ryugu, right? <laughs> Her main interests are planetary surfaces and their studies through near infrared spectroscopy to understand the processes that shape it, the different observed surfaces. She is also interested in trying to reconcile orbital and in situ observations and by trying to evaluate the impacts of scale effects regardless of the body that it is observed. The problematic is the same for mass and small uh, bodies. So thank you and thank you. go ahead. Uh, hi everyone, thanks a lot for having me here. I'm very happy to be presenting uh, a little bit of what I do. Uh, so I'm gonna talk today a uh, lot about near infrared spectroscopy and I'm gonna try to show a little bit of an overview of how we use it in space science to understand uh, mostly the surface of Mars, but also I'll talk a little bit about small bodies. Um, as Laura presented, I just brought up a slide with a bunch of my interest and expertise. I'll be very fast. Um, I study mostly Martian mineralogy. During my PhD, I was doing volcanism, and now I'm more interested in hydrated mineralogy. And technically, we detect hydrated minerals and things like that, and I'm going to show a lot of details. But mostly what I'm interested in, too, is to try to understand whether we could link the presence of water at some point to any kind of exobiological potential on Mars. And we often the Martian exploration has been always follow the water and now we are looking for biomarker and things like that and when we hear people talking about it I always understand that the link is very easy and I think it's not that, e that easy and I will try to be able to work with a different type of expertise to to make this link a little bit more clear uh, also I'm interested in small bodies using the same techniques so small bodies the story is a little bit different because they tell us more about the first stage of the solar system and we are trying to understand whether organic material are present or water-rich material and to understand also the cycle of this kind of material in the solar system and whether this kind of body could have bring some water to us or some organic material things like that. Um, as was mentioned before, what I really enjoy uh, is trying to, to make sure that what we see from orbit is consistent with what we see from the surface. So on Mars, we have rover on the surface and lots of um, orbiters around Mars. And we have a big picture and we have a good representativeness of the Martian surface when we have orbital data because we can see the entire Mars. But the resolution can be like kilometric scale or a couple of hundred meter scale. So we have wide information, but the scale is not that good. And if you go in situ, you don't know if it's, you have very good instrument and very precise measurement, but you don't know if it's representative of, of Mars or not because it's one spot. So either you got lucky and it's something very bizarre and rare, but you wouldn't know, or is it very representative of whatever we see? And also to make sure that the hypotheses we make from orbit are also consistent with what we observe from in situ. I think this is very fascinating. And to do this, I use near infrared spectroscopy. I'm gonna just say a few words about this because I'm going to talk about this during my entire talk. And uh, I do mineralogy, qualitative and quantitative. And I also am interested in the development and calibration of instrument. So on certain mission, I also work uh, before the instrument reach the planet um, and before we do the analysis. So a few words, as I said, on uh, near infrared spectroscopy. A very easy sketch. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just so everyone, make sure everyone has the gist of it. Uh, you have um, the sun, for example, illuminating its surface. We know exactly how the spectrum of the sun looks like. And then the light is reflected and which are instruments. And by looking at the difference between the sun spectrum and what we receive in our spacecraft, we are able to understand a little bit what's going on at the surface. And so this is the spectrum of the sun. 
And once we collect the spectrum of the sun from what we receive, we are able to see different kind of absorption features and things like that. So I work in the near infrared between 0.5 to 5 micron, roughly. And we are able to detect different types of mineral and say we observe this or this at whatever location on Mars. Also, there is two types of way to do it. I'm going to talk about those two. So in a few words, you can have point spectrometer. So this is an example of asteroid Ryugu. So we had just uh, a shooting spectrometer. So you have a spot of 40 meter per a spot of 40 meter diameter. And then you need other instruments to be able to know exactly where it is at the surface to try to see if you see differences at the surface. Or you can also do what is called hyperspectral imaging. So this time it's more like a camera. So you take a picture and at each, this is an example of Mars, uh, the uh, North Polar Cap of Mars. So at each pixel of this picture, you have the spectral information. So then you can, for example, trace water ice. This is just a quick map of water ice for this. So it's, there is a lot more of information with hyperspectral imagery, but the technique is exactly the same. It's just on Mars, we have this type of instrument. And also I show that we could do it with the sun from orbit, but also you can imagine instrument from the ground doing the same science, as long as you know uh, very well, I don't know what to shoot with that. As long as you know very well your sources, you can always do the same exercise and be like, I know exactly the spectrum of my sources. It interacts with the rocks. And in the end, I can, I can by evaluating the different, have access to the mineralogy at the surface. So from that, let's cut to the chase and talk a little bit about Mars. So I wanted to show a little bit of um, past, explore, past and ongoing exploration at Mars. So I just did a little sketch. It's not exhaustive, there is not all the mission. Basically, what I wanted to show is that there has been a lot of spacecraft going to Mars starting a long time ago with uh, the first uh, mission in 1970s. And it was mostly dominated by the US. And now after 2000, we can, I still cannot count, but on the left hand side, um, we can see that uh, there is now European mission and Chinese mission, Emirates mission, Russian mission, and it's going on and on and there is more rover at Mars, more orbiters. So Mars is, uh, it's a very hot topic right now and there is plenty of science to be done. Uh, I'm gonna mostly talk about those two missions. Well, I'm gonna mostly talk about Mars Express, which is a European mission that was launched to Mars uh, almost 20 years ago. It just celebrated its 19th birthday a week ago. And I am also gonna talk a little bit about Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, and about two instruments on board those two spacecraft. So on board of Max Express, I'm gonna show a lot of data from the Omega instrument, which is uh, near infrared hyperspectral imager. And I'm gonna show some results also from CRISM, which is on board MRO. I'm not always safe if it's from Omega or for CRISM. I just want to acknowledge that the results I'm gonna show come from both instruments. And I'm gonna now talk a little bit about the hydrogen mineralogy at Mars, show a little bit of the state of the art and the question we are trying to answer with our work. Um, so a little bit of history with the um, Omega instrument where I made the first detection uh, from orbit of hydrogen minerals at Mars. So at first, I, it's very small, but uh, this is a map of, of Mars, uh, like we see on Earth. So it's just a project projection. Some detection of hydrated minerals, we can see that it's not very precise because there is blobs and stuff like that. So we say, oh, in this location, we have hydrated minerals, but it's not very precise. This was done in 2004. Um, if we zoom in, we can see that, for example, this big region is indicated here in red. And when you look at it, this is all igneous minerals. So it's nothing hydrated in there. And there is just a chunk of a little bit of um, one, hydration band that indicates the presence of, of OH. Um, so three main regions were detected at that time, like Valles Marineris here, uh, this region and this region that are very well known now. And a fewer spots of like sporadic detection, verified or not verified, but this was the first map. And it's done by looking at the spectrum, as I said before. So I just show an example of spectra here. Uh, laboratory spectra in blue, so what we expect from hydrated minerals, clay minerals, and things like that. And both Omega spectra downstairs, 
And we can see that we don't see much, <laughs> but when we actually look at a region that is not hydrated in orange here and a region that is hydrated in red, and we do a ratio of the two, we can highlight the presence of hydrated band when we compare to the lab. And we are able to say, oh, because we see those different absorption features, well, we detect a clay mineral. And depending on the depth and the position, we are able to say if it's iron rich, aluminum rich, or things like that. And then we can give insights on the formation processes. Uh, yeah, this is just a map of one of the hydrated uh, sites at that time. And um, it was very unprecedented and we detect so bunch of hydrated minerals in different locations. But thanks to that, we were able to bring new pieces to the puzzle and actually propose a new scheme for the Martian evolution. Um, so the usual Martian geological scheme is based on the volcanism, when it happened, when it stopped, and things like that. So it's Noachian, Esperian, and Amazonian geological era. And then thanks to the detection of different hydrated minerals, we were able to give more insights on what happened at Morse. So with first formation of clay minerals in the presence of probably hot and wet Morse, I'm, I'm being cautious because it's still debated, but uh, then a global change in the climate of Mars, a very much more acidic environment, environment to um, form sulfates, and then no more water at all, and only the presence of anhydrous ferric oxide that were formed at that time. So with the detection uh, in 2004 of a bunch of hydrated location at Mars, we were able to have a very much new vision of the evolution of Mars. Up. Uh, I just wanted to show the evolution of those kinds of map. So the first one, not very precise. We don't see much of this one because much, lots of detection were actually erased and the resolution is not that good. And then the latest that's gonna be published soon with all the detection after more than 10, 15 years of studying all this detection, we now see that there is, you don't maybe see all of them, but there is blue spot which indicate hydrated minerals in lots and lots of places. So before we thought it was very, specific to some location at Mars. And now we are able to see that actually most of the very old terrains at Mars are about hydrated minerals. And if it doesn't show in some location here, it doesn't mean it's not present. It can mean that we don't see it because we're doing it from orbit with a very rough resolution. There is dust, there is clouds, there is plenty of things that can also hide detections. So this probably is not exhaustive. Um, so yeah, we went from very sporadic detection to widespread detection with aqueous mineral that are not an exception anymore at Mars. Um, it's always consistent with the fact that the older terrains are altered and the newer one are not. So probably alteration um, and aqueous alteration. So presence of water happened very early on in Martian history. Um, and we have various detection of different uh, assemblages of mineral. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that to try to explain depending on which mineral we see, what kind of processes can be hidden behind and also what will be the implication for the presence of water or a potential exobiological uh, activity at Mars. Um, so many classes of mineral uh, that have been detected, I'm gonna explain uh, some of them as a form and things like that. So we have different type of phyl phyllosilicates as are clays who mostly form under water condition. They can be rich in aluminum, in iron, in magnesium, things like that. Uh, carbonates and sulfates. They were detected from orbit with chrism and omega, and they were detected through absorption features. This is not an exhaustive scheme, but you can see like this is Martian spectrum, all of the above from chrism. Plenty of different types of minerals are observed at the surface. It's like there is a very wide, uh, different types of assemblages. And so how do they form? So we have uh, some ideas. So for clay minerals, for example, we know that they are highly altered products uh, that involve the presence of water. So this is one of the hypotheses. It could be linked to the aquability of Mars. So some people talk about habitability, aquability, and things like that. I think um, aquability, it's, I, I like it more because it means that it's the presence of liquid water. And it doesn't mean it's habitable. It just means that there is liquid water. So it's a little bit different. So probably there has been a lot of liquid water at Mars to form those minerals. 
Um, this is an example of a location at Mars. So we can see that we see different types of layers of mineral depending on their composition. So iron rich, iron rich, and then iron and silicate rich. And the thing is there is different hypotheses. So maybe the iron rich formed before. So first episode of alteration. And then in time, there was another episode of alteration. So the iron rich were altered again and became iron rich through alteration. Or it could also be that it was one episode of alteration, but the minerals before alteration were not the same. Some were more iron rich, some were more iron rich. So we don't really know how to decipher those kind of processes. But we know, we assume that those minerals come from not hydrating mineral. There has been an episode of alteration. So we call them secondary clays. It's not primar primary minerals. Other potential hypotheses on their formation is that they form through magmatic uh, precipitation. So during volcanism, uh, magma very much enriched in water would have produced this kind of mineral. So in that case, it would be primary clays. So the presence of, I'm going to explain this sketch, but first the presence of this kind of clay that could have formed through magmatic precipitation has been uh, detected in meteorites of Mars. So we know that the process, this process can occur, but we don't know if it's local, global at Mars, or if it can explain all the hydrated mineral we see. And for this kind of formation, we don't need liquid water. The water is present within the magma, but we don't need the presence of lakes and sea and things like that. So it's a very different story if we go in that direction. And those would be primary clay. So it, they don't come from a product of alteration. They were formed as is. And so they don't imply liquid water, but actually through the formation processes from the magma, that could be niche, uh, that would be very specific in terms of uh, condition and that, would, that might be interesting for emergence of life. So doesn't mean that because there is no liquid water, there is no potential for habitability. Uh, second type of mineral that's very important for uh, this kind of question is carbonates because they have a high exobiological potential. Um, their, form their formation at Mars implies the presence of a thick CO2 atmosphere um, and the presence of liquid water. They've been detected in only a few locations at Mars. They've been detected globally, and this is why we went to G0 crater because there is some carbonate there. Um, they've been detected, so yeah, in G0 crater here in color, and also they've been detected in meteorite, Martian meteorite. So they're present not as much as phyllosilicates as I showed before, but they're still present at the surface and they have other implications in terms of form formation processes. And also, for example, for the operators, they are also associated with delta-like feature. So I'm not a geologist, so I'm, I don't want to give a bad name to this, but they, they are, those are features that look like feature we see on Earth, where there, are, there is a flowing liquid to form this kind of feature, so probably flowing water at some point at the surface of Mars. And the last ones are sulfates. Um, so they form after, during Martian history, in a more acidic and dry environment. Um, they didn't form in a good environment for emergence of life, but they are very interested because they are known to harbor a lot of water. So maybe today they might be interested for exploration to go in those places to see if we can uh, extract this water, for example. Uh, they are very, very widely present at Mars in lots and lots of places. And yes, they are less adequate for the emergence of living organisms. And so we have all of this background on the hydrogen mineralogy on Mars. Plenty of hydrogen minerals have been detected, different classes leading to different processes of formation, uh, leading to different implication in terms of the presence of water and in terms of potential emergence of life or potential survival of life. And based on that, we wanted uh, to go a little bit farther because all of these analysis are mainly based on detection. So we are able to say in this spot, we see this type of minerals. And now what we wanted to, to do is to say in this spot, we see this composition of mineral. So X amount of one mineral and Y amount of another mineral. So mostly quantifying um, what we observe to try to, to tune a little bit and refine the, from the mechanism formation. 
And also in order to be able to know how much water is stored in this mineral. And I'm gonna explain how we did that. So we go from all those de de this detection and we use this time modeling. I'm gonna show an example. So we use uh, radiative transfer modeling interaction between the light and our samples. And we are able to extract a more precise composition at each location on the surface. Uh, we did that with the entire Omega data set. So we are lacking observation for CRISM. So two different instruments, but they do the same kind of science. Omega has a very global view of the Martian surface with a spatial resolution of one kilometer to 200 meters at the surface. So imagine on Earth, if we were looking at a one kilometer square, you have some information, but you're also missing a lot of information, but you have at least a global view. Um, and so this, those are all the detection at Mars where we identify several hydrogen minerals. The color corresponds to the number of hydrogen minerals. So the complexity, if I may say, of the assemblages. So we have region here with lots of different uh, hydrogen minerals. We don't know in which quantity yet. Those region again with lots. And some region with just doesn't mean that there is less in quantity, but it means that the assemblage is, is not as complex. So maybe form only of one or two hydrogen minerals. And so through the modeling, we are able to uh, obtain a quantitative analysis. So this is just an example of omega spectrum. So the omega spectrum is a very noisy one. And in red is the results of the model. And the model gives us in the end for this spectrum, for example, a composition of four hydrogen minerals only. Uh, stacking up to 60% almost and 40% of other, so mainly unhydrated minerals for this type. For all locations where we see hydrated mineral, we have a lot of non hydrated mineral as well. Um, and so we have in the end this kind of maps. So if I go back, we have, no, I'm going to not go back, I'll show later. Uh, so we have this kind of map. We can have the number of hydrated minerals and then we are able to say, the quantity of hydrogen mineral in all those locations. This is a sum of all of them. We have individual map for 11 different hydrogen minerals. So for all of them, we have individual map. I, it's too long to explain all of them. So I like to show the one where we see the sum of all the hydrogen minerals. Again, we can see location when it's red, it means that there, are, there is more up to 50%. So it means that even in those locations, 50% of the surface is non-hydrated. It's volcanism rocks at Mars. And we have region with um, hydrated minerals when you have only two, 3% in the entire mixture of hydrated minerals, still a lot of igneous mineral. I want to insist on this point because it's not fully hydrated. Um, in average, we have some hydrated mineral with up to 15%, but globally it's less than 10% for all of them. And some of them are present in most location where you see hydrated minerals, for example, uh, phyllosilicate like nontronite, uh, ferrihydrite also is detected a lot. Uh, we have celadonite also, but for example, carbonates, they are only detected in less than 1% of all these pixels. So it's very different type of distribution as I was showing before. Thanks to the modeling, we can access a lot more of information that is not accessible if we don't do it. So, this is a correlation uh, sketch. All the minerals are here and here again. And depending on the color, it means that they are highly correlated or not. I'm just gonna explain one example, for example. So if it's blue, it means that it's highly correlated. So thanks to the modeling, we are able to say that location where we find this type of mineral, chlorite, is highly uh, correlated with the location where we find micas, for example. And this is something without the modeling we cannot access. And hopefully being able to see those correlation or anti-correlation when it's very red will help us to understand what kind of formation process are behind. It's, it gives us a lot more of information than if you don't do modeling. Um, what we'd also want to do with that is help for the preparation of future landing, landed mission. So I'm gonna show you an example for Oxia Planum. So we have the global map that I showed before with Omega, 20 hundred meter per pixel to up to one kilometer, depending on the type of observation. Um, this is a global view. We can go at a more local view. This is the Oxia Plan Planum site. 
um, each of those different maps correspond to each of the different hydrated minerals that were uh, modeled. So we can try to start to look more closely at the surface and try to understand in Oxia planum, the how come we observe this kind of, of different assemblages. And also um, we can start to do measurement in the lab to prepare for investigation that will happen on the surface. And we use exactly the same type of technique in the lab with Martian analog. And we do the same kind of study at the microscopic scale this time. So this is not on Mars, this is analog of Mars. And we try to see if we see similarities to what is shown on Oxia and if we can plan for the measurements from once we'll be on Mars and see what we can do. So that's for the mineralogy. With the quantification, we can go a little bit further and try to have information on the water because those minerals were from with the presence of water. And so what we did next is we're trying to understand how, where, how much water is there in, in the crust of Mars through those minerals because actually on Mars, we don't, we don't really know where the water went. We know that there has been water at some time. This is just a sketch to, to show some, some exchanges of water. So water have been there, now it's gone. It could have escaped uh, through space. Um, volcanism brought some water. There is some exchange of liquid water with the atmosphere. There are also the polar caps. We know that they have a little bit of water. And there are some hypotheses on how much water has been lost through crustal hydration. So meaning has been lost through alteration of igneous minerals. And with the model, we are a little bit able to quantify how much water we observe actually at the surface of Mars. And I'm going to explain this in a, in a few words. Um, so back to all the minerals we model, this is a bit technical, so I'm going to go fast. We model 11 minerals. We have a quantity for each of them. It's a model, so there are uncertainties, of course, but for each of them, we have a quantity. And with that, we want to evaluate how much water. So we have to, to um, have an idea of the chemical formula of those minerals because we know that they have uh, H2O compound in each of them. But the thing is on Mars, the um, actual chemical formula cannot be known. So we have a range of potential chemical formulas for each of them. So we know that neutronite can be more rich in uh, Na or Ca. It can be more iron rich or things like that. So we have a range of possibilities and it can have a lot of water or not a lot of water. So we did some hypotheses to try to estimate the best chemical formula. So we have a range. And for each of those minerals, we are able to say, okay, based on several cases, we can have access to the percentage of water that is stored in those minerals. And this, this is a little bit sketch I show. So if we stick to only one, of, this is all the different minerals, but let's stick to one of them, nontronite, for example. So you have, different possibilities of formulas depending if we reach if we if we select na or ca so we tried all of them so it gives us range so basically we have low hydration hydration state moderate hydration state and high hydration state we selected number based on literature of course and depending on on the mass we have different way of ranges so you can see it can be quite uh, large scale. So depending on the chemical formula we choose, we can say, okay, neutronite account to 10% of water. Or if we have a high hydration state, it could be up to 40% of water. So the numbers and certainty can be very wide. But because the um, abundances of hydrated minerals at the surface is very small, overall, the uncertainty are not that big in the end. But it can, we have a wide range of possibilities still. I'm just going to show you an average case of what we obtain in terms of um, percentage of water at the surface of Mars based on hydrated silicate. So this is just an histogram of all the detection. It peaks around 5%. And in other color, it's other measurements. So we wanted to make sure that we fit within what has been observed, for example, here in Gale Crater, so in situ, in meteorite, for example, from orbit with other instruments, from orbit with other instruments. And lately, there is a location where, we, where they found 40% of water in Valles Marineri, so it's far off what we observe. But compared to other studies, we fall within 5% of water. So there is a few percent of hydrogen minerals, and they account for 5% of water 
at those locations at the surface of Mars, which is which is not a lot if if we want to think in terms of, for example, in situ resource utilization, if we want to to go harbor the water. And it's not that much in terms of crystallization. So if all the surface is made up of 5% of water, we didn't lose that much water in the in the soils. And I'm gonna show some, some numbers. Uh, but first I wanted to show the distribution, just so you have an idea so that it's not exactly the same everywhere. So this is the percentage of water at the surface of Mars. We um, find that the largest region with water content are very well known already. They are highly hydrated region at Mars. Uh, we have Nili Fosse, we have Valles Marineris, and no, we have, sorry, Mars Valis and um, Meridiani Planum. But also with this study, we started to find, let's say, new location uh, that can be a little, quite big, like hundreds of kilometers square with more than 10% of water. So maybe we will start to look a little bit more in detail within those regions because those three in yellow are on the spot and they are very well known and there is a lot of information, but uh, doesn't mean that there are no other interesting spots at Mars for uh, exobiological potential. Uh, the last thing I wanted to discuss is the estimation of water loss. So from this study, we wanted to estimate, so normally on Mars, we evaluate the amount of water that there were before in terms of global equivalent layer. So the global equivalent layer is the number of meter if you have a full ocean around Mars. So one meter of a full ocean around Mars, two meter of a full ocean around Mars. And we know that thousand of meter in global equivalent layer were lost through uh, different processes that we don't know exactly which they are. And we wanted to know how much could have been lost through crystal hydration. And the thing is, all of what I show is very much to the top surface. We are only looking at a few micrometers at the surface, but you can imagine that the hydrated deposit can be very much thicker. Like some studies show that we can have kilometers of hydrated depo deposit. With the analysis I'm doing with near infrared spectroscopy, it's not possible to know. So we need to, to combine those measurements with other instruments to try to evaluate at each location how much of uh, hydrated minerals we have, which could add up a lot of water. And also what I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, we have all those detection, but where we don't see hydrated minerals doesn't mean that there is no hydrated minerals. We have a lot of bias from orbit. So it can be dust, it can be, it can be a poor in observation with the instrument, it can be by bad signal over those ratios. There is plenty of, of reasons. So probably there is 10% more of the surface that is globally um, hydrated than what we see, so that will also add up a lot. Uh, I didn't want to, to leave a, a number here because this is a, a work in progress, but so far we have very, very low estimation of, of the water that could have been lost through those processes. Um, this is going to be uh, my last slide on Mars, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, small bodies after that. But um, to go back to the main question I'm wondering about, and I hope a little bit between what I, with what I presented, you, you understand where I'm coming from with what I do. Um, I, I want to understand that if the aquability of Mars can di directly be linked to the, um, to the habitability past or present. Um, and I try to bring insights on that using hydrated mineral GN Mars. Um, can we decipher the formation processes of hydrated silicate? As I showed a little bit at the beginning, it could have been formed with a lot of water. Maybe it was formed as primary minerals through uh, precipitation of magma. So those are questions that are, for some people, still yet unanswered. Um, will all of those studies of water have an impact on the, uh, to, with respect to the exobiological potential of Mars? And also, of course, I'm very much interested in helping prepare the investigation for future land admission and um, mass sample return that's going to happen very soon. So in very soon, within 10 years, probably we'll have samples back from Mars. So we need to know which sample we are catching and have a very good idea of where we are catching them. So those orbital studies are very, very interesting for that because we are able to bring in context the samples that we will bring back. So those are the main questions and things I'm 
I'm working on on Mars. And I wanted to show a little bit of application of near infrared uh, spectroscopy to small bodies. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Hayabusa 2 mission. So you're going to see that the science is very different. The technique is the same, but the results are very different. And I, I think I really enjoy this also. Um, so if you don't know about the Hayabusa 2 mission, it's a Japanese mission that was launched in 2014, uh, des designated to go study asteroid Ryugu. It's a mission in three stages, orbital characterization. I really like this image when we see the shadow of the spacecraft. The, we also landed on the asteroid with a small shoebox to do some in situ measurement. And also some samples were brought back to Earth for uh, being analyzed into the lab. So it's, you have all the scales. So I really enjoy that. You have same time, all the same instruments. So you're able to say if this is the same thing from orbit, from in situ and in the lab. So it's very, very interesting. Um, I'm gonna start a little bit to show some results from orbit. And you're gonna see it's a different story <laughs> than what I showed on Mars. Uh, this is just, uh, so same technique, a near infrared spectrometer is just a point spectrometer, but with other instruments, we are able to say where it shoots at the surface. Uh, we have, 56 observation total, but because the asteroid is spinning, one observation, we can actually see the entire asteroid. I wanted to show, this is a map of the asteroid, basically the density of observation. So where it's red, it means that we observed a lot of time. And when it's blue or dark, we just have a bunch of observation, but we have a lot of statistics and we are able to see, especially we see some differences at the surface. And we also, due to the altitude of the spacecraft, have different resolution size measurements. So if this is the asteroid at this scale, all the type of measurements are shown here. So AB is very big, then we have some measurements a little bit smaller, but basically the resolution is quite low from orbit with these, with these instruments. And the results are as follows. So this is one spectrum in the near infrared of the near three instrument. All the surface of, of the asteroid looks like that. <laughs> So, well, not all of it with small differences, but it's very much the same. It's very homogeneous at this scale. So it's, it's, it's very different uh, type of, of analysis. So you can see a slight red slope. This is the characteristic we decided to mention and an absorption feature here, which is interesting because it shows that there is hydrated minerals at the surface of the asteroid. Uh, it's, very homogeneous. Uh, this band is present everywhere. It has the exact same characteristics. And yeah, I wanted to show Mars again to show it's very different. Mars, we have plenty of different things. And here we have one spectrum and we have to understand whether this asteroid is very homogeneous, whether we can fine tune calibration and find some differences in the spectrum and things like that. And it's, it's, a, it's a very tricky exercise. Uh, but basically, we know that there is hideous min hydrous mineral across the entire asteroid, and it's super homogeneous at the meter scale, which is why bringing back sample now is very important. So I'm going to show some results of the samples being brought back. Um, this is one instrument. It's a near infrared spectrometer that was installed in the curation facility in JAXA in Japan. So the curation facility is a smallish uh, white room, uh, clean room, where we analyze the sample. And four instruments were installed, and this is one of them. Uh, it was installed a little bit before the sample came back. So in August, the sample were back in December. And daily, we do operation with this instrument to look at every particle that was brought back. So we have five grams, hundreds of, of grains of sand, and one by one, we look at them. Uh, for example, we did one this month. Yeah. Yes. And the instrument is, is, is miniaturized because it's, it's meant to fly. So it's, it's, it's very, very small. Yeah, and the window is like that. Um, and yeah, so yeah, this morning we did operation for one grain. For example, I'm just gonna show one and then show some results. So this is one particle. It's globally, they all are one micron scale. So this is an image from this instrument. And at each pixel, like, like I presented before, we have spectral information, so we can do same type of analysis. And we have 
three to four hours to measure one particle and hundreds and hundreds of particles. So it's gonna, it's gonna be a very long process. And just a few spectrum to show you a little bit what I was talking about at the very beginning between orbital and in situ characterization and the difference we can observe. So in blue, it's a representative spectra of what we observe in the lab from the samples who have been brought back. And in gray and black, it's what we observe from orbit. So when we look at it like that, it's very similar. So it's good in the way that we are able to say we actually brought back samples. Well, uh, the high abuse mission actually brought back samples from asteroid Ryugu, which is very important per se. Uh, but also when we dig a little bit more in every grain, we are able to see slight differences that we don't, do not observe from orbit. So it changes the hypothesis of formation that we have from orbit because we see very, very different things. And I'm just going to show a bunch of examples. Uh, all of those are in the lab. So you have the scale here is all images from Micromega. And for example, it's RGB images. So if you see a color, it means that it's peculiar. So we have different type of spectrum, pink one, red one, and, and green one. Uh, so at this scale, we are able to observe carbonates, for example. So one of the hydrogen minerals I was mentioning on Mars. So we see the same type of mineral everywhere in the solar system, nothing exotic so far. Um, we absolutely do not see them from orbit. They bring a lot of insights on the, the alteration episodes that might have happened at Ryugu. Again, the uh, work that cannot be done from orbit. And we also see some more exotic nitrogen rich hydrogen minerals and some diaspora like so the different type of hydrogen minerals that are, were absolutely not detected from orbit um, and from this work now that we have this observation basically i'm trying to go back a little bit uh, to the orbital data and see if there is ways or analytical techniques or modeling to be able to see if we can detect those from orbit. I think it's going to be very tricky, but I'm trying to do that in order to be able to reconcile a little bit more what we observe from orbit and from uh, in situ. And the last slide, it's, it's um, just to show an extent of what can be done with uh, near infrared spectroscopy. It's the very last one. I'm going to switch bodies, but it's just an example because I'm also here to, to show what I do and see if people are interested in this kind of job. So this technique is used on all the bodies in the solar system. And the last one I'm mentioning is Callisto, so one of the moon of Jupiter. So what we do is we have, we know that it's full of ice. And with the modeling that I showed on Mars, we do the same kind of modelization. And we are able to say what type of ice. And also we are able to say, the, the size of the grain size of the high of the ice. So we have a variation in terms of grain sizes. It's all done with near infrared spectroscopy. We do modeling and we can try to understand how the movement of ice and how the ice is built and what different type of ice we have on this kind of body. So this is also, this is completely preliminary and ongoing. And this is new science to me, but I think it's very nice to be able to combine the same technique and try to do uh, different type of science. So I think that's it for my talk. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any question. Thank you, Lucy. Very interesting. Before asking if someone else has a question, I, I wanted to ask you about the sample collection in uh, Ryugu. Ryu. Yes. Uh, how was it? Was it uh, a powder from the surface or little fragments? How were they collected? So this is, is a, is there is a video on YouTube. I don't have the internet, but I, you should check it out. It's very nice. They go down, they shoot something and they are fire. They suck it. Yeah, they suck it. They suck it back to the sample catcher. In, in form of uh, solid pieces yeah. or powder? Yeah, well, what they, what, what whatever. There? Sorry? Okay, yes. but in powder. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And the second question was, I, I, it may be a little bit naive because I'm not into this type of technique, but when you show the maps, the, the near red, infrared um, images of uh, these measurements in Callisto and, yes. and Yugu, it was like sort of a continuous map, but in Mars, when you show the- The first one? I don't know, it was a hydrated uh, silicate or- Yes. Uh, it was only dots 
I wonder if the measurement is just picked in one spot and you were interested only in the delta and water features, or there is nothing. If there is it. no color, it's because there is nothing. But the measurement is like a continuous yes. measurement. Yeah. So for example, if I go back to one of my very first slides, which is actually a good example of what you asked, it's gonna take me some time because I have a lot of slides. <laughs> but you're gonna see, for example, so we have uh, images everywhere. And if it's colored, coded, it's because we have detection. So detection can be based of, on plenty of things. Yes, this one. Oh, I was sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go slow. It's like so you just have to start again. One. So yes, this one. So for example, this is a typical image we have on Mars and then we did global, global maps, but this one here. And then if I look on this image for H2O, water ice, then I'm left with that. Mm -hmm. So if it's dark, it means that there is no H2O on this map. Does that answer your question? Yeah, actually, I was talking about the, the other maps you have passed with little dots in different colors, colors like, like, no, not that one. But the, the, the maps with the little dots are made from the same type, like this one. For yeah, example. for example, that one, that, that's okay. As we see colors only in some spots, yes. it is because there is only material, whatever, they, yes. they hydrate it, only in those spots, yes. but you scan they have been the whole. detected only in those spots, but we have a full coverage of the Martian surface. So we have okay. analyzed the entire Martian surface and okay. they are detected only at those spots. But as I was mentioning, if some location, for example, here on Mars, all of this is very dusty. So there is plenty of dust that's covering the surface. So we don't have colored dots, but maybe below the dust. Yeah. If we go. <laughs> okay, I see. Thank you. So there is time for some more questions. Does anyone in the audience want to ask something? Or on the Zoom session, Maria. First, Olga is going to ask something, but otherwise you can read us the questions on the... Okay. Um, my question is about mineralogy, <laughs> not about vermiculite, but one, in, one important uh, mineral uh, associated with large bodies of water, at least in the earth is um, halite or some chlorides, chlorides in general. I know that infrared, near infrared is not good for that kind of minerals. For chloride? Chloride. <laughs> for example, NaCl. Yes. yes. So uh, halite or maybe uh, magnesium chloride. <laughs> okay. But uh, as far as I know, uh, there are some detections in the thermal infrared mm -hmm. of chlorides. Um, and I know that, for example, at Ceres, there are detections of chlorides because, because uh, they are um, hydrated. Uh, do you know if in Mars are any detection of Actually, hydrated chloride? So it's not my main area of expertise, but I read that there has been a few. And I think it's, well, I, I, this is recorded, so I'm not going to be careful with what I did, with what I say. But I think some detection has been made around ELAS. Mm -hmm. But a few, and I think you can, I think it's published. So but, but, but it's with, with semis, with, or with thermal with, infrared. With neonfire. With near infrared, yes, I believe. Oh, I believe, but to be checked. But I, I believe, but yes, but not a lot. Just for curiosity, <laughs> when you listed the the minerals uh, that you use, that I modeled those ones. Uh, not this one. The the ones that you use uh, for the. One, yeah, here. <laughs> why, why Why we use this mineral? Yeah, so, 
uh, instead uh, moronite mo mo or yes so both of them have been detected and so this is linked to the model because in order to model the, the spectrum, we need to give optical constants. So we need to put n member, like a specific one. We did some tests with monomorionite and we did some, some tests with BID light and the model works better with BID light. That's why. And the thing is we could put more, we could put the two of them, but then there are risk of degeneracy mm -hmm. and the, if you add new end members, the time also increased very fast. And those modelization has been made on millions of spectrum and it took about a year to complete. So if you increase the number of end member, you increase the number of tests. <laughs> but we did some tests with Momorionite also. And in the end, we stick with BD Light due to the model fitting uh, that was a lot better with BD Light. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, Maria, there seems not to be any questions. Oh, yes, we have one. Hi. <laughs> um, I have two questions. Yes. I don't know much about this technique, so sorry if it's a super obvious question. Um, so the first thing is, um, what I read is that this technique is measuring the absorption of the covalent uh, bonding mm -hmm. between hydrogen and carbon, oxygen and nitrogen. Is that your question? Well, that's the beginning <laughs> of the question. <laughs> Is it measuring something else apart from that? Uh, I'm not sure, hundred percent. I wouldn't want to say something. Okay, no, because my question was, I I don't know why carbonates are being measured because they don't have hydrogen, and oh, I don't understand how that works. Uh, yeah, uh, but they have, so what we, I can show you a spectrum of carbonates and see that they absorb a lot in the near infrared due to, I wouldn't be able to say due to which transition, but those are spectrum of carbonates in the near infrared. And this band and those three ones are very characteristic of carbonates. Okay, and how is, how is it working? Yes, but not with hydrogen, not I guess, with something else. Okay, so it does measure yes. other things. Okay, and the other thing is, how do you how do you know the grain size? Oh, the last slide I showed. So the thing is, with the so depending, I don't have a graph to show that, I, I could, but depending on the grain size, the measurement, if you observe like the same, exactly the same thing, like let's take a carbonate for example with a grain size of 100 micron or one micron, the spectrum is gonna be different in terms of, um, so it's gonna be brighter or darker due to the grain size. And with the model, it gives you an abundance of what you observe and it also gives you a grain size. So it, it adapts to fit with a, with a different grain size. And this is how we obtain it with the model. Without the model, unless it's pure, it's very, and we do need to do lab measurement to compare, but unless it's something very pure, we cannot, but the model gives us, it's a model, so with uncertainties, but at least relatively, it can give us a lot of information to the distribution at the surface. At least something is different. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much for your talk and to come in here to talk about your work. And I wanted to ask you, with the Mars sample return mission right around the corner and your experience in this asteroid, <laughs> uh, taking samples and also doing uh, uh, work. Yeah. <laughs> what do you expect to find different? Because you say that there are clear differences in the what you expect to find and what did you find. On Mars, what do you expect to find differently? Ah, very good question. Well, so I think it can also go, go back to the question that on Mars from orbit, we say this type of mineral or this type of mineral, but sometimes it's hard to discriminate exactly. I think from the lab is going to be either with the same technique and because of the scale being different, we will have more information or with other technique in the lab because the technology on Earth is a lot 
better than what we can send to Mars. Um, so yeah, it's going to, I think it's going to refine a lot the end member, even when I show like a chemical formula to use, we have a bunch of ideas of what can it be, but from Earth, we will probably be able to know exactly what it is, so it would give us a lot of information. Only problem is for me with this kind of thing is that it's a sample from one location at Mars, so it's, it's going to give us a lot of information, but doesn't mean we can apply this information to the rest of Mars. So it's going to, it's, I think it's going to be a very tricky exercise, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, the good thing is we'd be different kind of samples yes. that will be like a keystone to, you know, interpret yes. the, the whole so planet. So we have yeah. context from orbit, so we'll be able to say in this specific context, but yeah, it's, it's going to be very tricky. So it's going to be a lot okay, of fun. thank you very much. Okay, Maria, is there any question on the remote session? Yes, uh, hi, uh, thank you very much for the, for the nice talk. Uh, there is a question from Hector Vives Farias, and he's asking, if it wasn't for the dust coverage, would, you, would we expect many more hydrated minerals in the Northern Hemisphere if the flat terrain was covered by, any, by an ocean? Do we expect hydrated minerals to be there under the dust layer? Um, thank you a lot for the question. Um, I don't know exactly the so so the so northern uh, the northern hemisphere of Mars is younger, so we expect less hydrated minerals because they are found in older terrain. But from what we observe from orbit, I think there is some some calculations that are made that um, indicate that we might have. 10 times more uh, hydrated mineral globally at Mars in other terrain uh, than what we observe from orbit with omega increase and so far. So probably one order of magnitude more, but not, a speci not, speci not, speci not specifically in the northern terrain. But this can cover a lot of things for sure. We have to go sweep. OK, thank you. Okay, so if there is no more questions, neither here or on the remote session, we're going to conclude here and uh, saying thank you very much, thank Lucy, you very for much your very interesting me. talk.